It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Daniele Lezzi from Barcelona Super Com Barcelona Super Computing Center. Daniele got his PhD in Italy actually, and he had, he had actually a bright uh, career at DSC in the uh, Rosas Badias group. Yes. Uh, his focus uh, is uh, research focuses on uh, workflow and uh, especially uh, computing infrastructure for uh, for uh, scientific workloads. So this is a perfectly the next step after HPC Garment. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you, Daniela, for being you, here. Buddy. And please. Thank you. So can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. So yes. Um thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm Daniela. Yes, I uh, I had my career here in Italy in the University of Lecce and then I moved 16 years ago already in the workflow distributed computing group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So you know that BSC is uh, one of the biggest centers for HPC in Europe. Um, so together with Leonardo, that you heard, uh, I think that during the week you had some other colleagues from BSC, Filippo, right, that was here. So uh, we have Marino Son 5 now, uh, that together with Leonardo and Lumi in the North Europe, are uh, the three uh, top uh, so far uh, supercomputers in Europe. The next one will be in uh, in uh, Germany, in Zurich. That will be an exascale uh, supercomputer because we are now Leonardo Malinostum are still pre exascale. Uh, even though Malinostum is going to increase uh, already uh, next year. Anyway, so what uh, so the, the previous session was quite uh, uh, maths oriented. But as Pasqua said, no, uh, uh, for example, Jack Dongara was a mathematician, uh, very good. So in my session will be less mathematician in the sense that we work, of course, also on what was explained before on this um, linear algebra uh, uh, issues, but from another, uh, from another angle. So what we do, um, that's why the, the name, we work more on uh, tools and frameworks for distributing the computational loads on mm, different backends, computational backends. Uh, this uh, that we call distributed infrastructure. Distributed means uh, several things, at least uh, for us. Uh, distributed can be also actually supercomputer for us uh, is a distributed set of nodes because as I will explain, we treat these nodes as independent computing units, aggregated, but still independent as you understand from our uh, view of the programming model and then of course we work with the uh, distributed supercomputers so different supercomputers for example we can distribute loads uh, to Marino also and Leonardo at the same time uh, we've been working uh, in the past years on uh, grids it was the, the idea of grid computing that now a bit disappeared because actually evolved not disappeared to the cloud and also we work on, uh, on clouds and now what we, uh, all this computing infrastructure, what we call is computing continuum. So when we say computing continuum, uh, actually we say a lot of things. Uh, why? Because before we were working just on these big machines, no? On clusters or also on servers and local to you know, premises in a, in a laboratory, in a faculty. But now everything that we have uh, a mobile, whatever, has uh, enough computing uh, capacity to perform uh, certain uh, operations. That's why now there is this idea of the uh, edge to cloud uh, computing continuum, where edge is where the data is produced by sensors, right? And then this, uh, uh, this sensor, the data that is produced by these uh, uh, devices is computed uh, locally for for do some pre um, uh, pre processing, and then the output of this pre processing may be sent to higher level in the hierarchy of the computation uh, to perform more aggregated uh, uh, computation using uh, more powerful uh, resources. So anyway, what we do in our case is uh, uh, to provide the the tools and the methodologies to uh, access in a seamless way uh, this distributed set of uh, 
uh, of uh, computing. And uh, we take care of managing the ledger data uh, that is produced and is uh, uh, transferred to, to in this continuum. And uh, of course, we include in all these uh, uh, pictures uh, artificial intelligence, of course, um, in, uh, in a way that I will explain uh, later. So um, since the beginning, uh, our motivation for in our group, let's say the work that we do in our in our group since the beginning is to treat uh, from the point of view of the developer to treat the computing infrastructure in a, uh, in a transparent uh, way. So we deal with uh, heterogeneous infrastructures in a, in a running uh, in the run of an application. So we have complex applications that are composed of different components with different granularities, different uh, resource uh, requirements, different pieces of software. And uh, we let the user uh, just focus on the uh, scientific problem on the application and mm, trying to avoid him or her uh, to um, think about how to use the, the resource itself, if it's a supercomputer, if it's a, it's a cloud, uh, et cetera. So, um, and, uh, in the, in the last year also, what we did was to integrate these classic, let's say, computational workloads with uh, machine learning, data analytics, and uh, now uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, that is a bit of way of natural, no? Uh, progressing of the, of the problem in the sense that you know that artificial intelligence is something that is not new. It exists, the concept of artificial intelligence uh, is from the 70s, maybe, okay? But uh, um, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about uh, also big quantities of data to, to process, to train the models, etc. So, and to process all this data, what we needed uh, was the uh, computing uh, capacities. So in the 60s, there was not enough computing. On the 70s, not enough uh, computing uh, capacities to process that big data. That's why now that we have uh, all these big, uh, computational uh, power and uh, having the last years uh, learned how to process big data also in cloud now we can uh, talk about artificial intelligence at this level of explosion there was a nat natural let's say process of uh, uh, mm, developing the algorithms then understand how to do big data if you remember, I don't know if you, if you're, I don't know if you had to deal with big data in the last uh, 15 years. Maybe the big concern was big data. So this idea of data mining, you no, know, all the Spark frameworks, like you no, know, uh, all the people were working on big data. Now all the people, uh, all the researchers are talking about artificial intelligence as a natural evolution. Okay, so now we understood how to deal with the big data. We know how to use the, the resources. And now that we have all the GPUs, uh, CPUs, et cetera, and we have these big supercomputers, we can natural talk about, naturally talk about uh, artificial intelligence. So, <clears throat> and also we are able now to use all these uh, resources in the computing continuum. So our motivation, as I said, is to offer uh, a programming framework that includes a, a programming model and the runtime, as I explained now, uh, to the researchers in order to avoid in any way the intricacies of the uh, compute technical computing infrastructures. So uh, this is a common view, let's say, at the, the BSC on programming models. Uh, uh, we have different programming models that we develop at Raxon Supercomputing Center, but the idea is, is the same. We have the applications, so you as a researcher, or scientific people program uh, application that deal with the different uh, problems in science. And then they have to use the different resources. So what we do, we develop a very uh, simple programming model layer, okay? That abstracts the, the technical details. And of course we have uh, powerful runtimes that are able to deal with big data uh, with uh, the, uh, uh, details of the heterogeneous resources, et cetera, okay? And then we use the APIs of the different uh, backends to uh, uh, deploy those applications, okay? 
And the idea is always the same. The program is independent of the underlying uh, computational platform. Uh, is a general purpose uh, task base. I will explain now what means task base, where there is no concept of uh, distributed memory. Okay, as you will have to do, for example, when you talk with the uh, MPI or Open OpenMP. And then there is this smart runtime that is able to parallelize the execution of the application, taking care of the distribution of the data and of the of the tasks, and uh, uh, is able to talk with different uh, provided for simple clouds. That's why we talk about interoperability. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, if you heard about OMS. I don't know if Philip explained you uh, OMS or not. But anyway, uh, we have this family of uh, uh, programming models, a family of uh, programming models at VSC that we talk start superscalar, okay? And then we have two uh, implementation of this uh, task-based uh, model. One is OMS, which is um, uh, an implementation, I would say, uh, an extension of the OpenMP programming model. You know OpenMP, which is uh, for intranode parallelization. And in that case, the granularity of the tasks is uh, uh, in the range of uh, milliseconds or microseconds. Okay, so are a small task where the dependencies between the execution of the task is uh, in uh, in memory. Okay, it's in the same uh, uh, address space, and uh, also OMS. So OMS is intranode, and is for applications that are programmed with C, C plus plus, and Fortran. So it's very optimized, you know, with application that have to run. Uh, in, in as much as possible optimal way in in a node of a supercomputer. On the other side, the, uh, our group we uh, develop the Com Superscalar programming uh, framework, and we deal with applications that are distributed, that programmed with the Java and Python now. Uh, and uh, here the tasks, the granularity of the task in our case uh, is from milliseconds, but um, usually we have uh, seconds of duration of the task to days. So it's higher level coarse grain uh, tasks, okay, that exchange not uh, data in the memory address space, but files or serialized uh, objects. Uh, the idea of task in a way, uh, when we talk about task-based programming uh, model, the idea of a task is uh, as part of an application of a sequential application that uh, has to be considered for uh, execution in parallel or in general to be distributed because it's called several times, a function in a loop, for example. It is called several times with different arguments or with different uh, data. And um, uh, or uh, mm, uh, functions that uh, are called in a way um, yeah, actually, the called many, many times. This is the, the, the main candidate for a, for a task. Okay, so more in, in detail, what we do um, is not a programming language. It could be, for example, OpenMP or MPI. So our programming model is a sequential uh, programming model. Sequential in the sense that you keep your application as it is, more or less. Uh, of course, you can refactor the application to um exploit what we call the inherent parallelism inside the execution of the application okay uh is a general purpose programming uh, language so there is you can use java c plus plus or python and uh, you extend your code with uh, annotations these annotations are um a way to tell to the to the runtime what has to be considered as task for example if we look at this uh, simple cost matrix multiplication. Uh, but anyway, I said, said it was simple here. Yeah. For example, this is a block uh, matrix multiplication, okay? So you have these uh, uh, three inner loops, okay? If you unroll this loop with a different in uh, index, indices, uh, you can understand that each, many of these calls are independent of each other because the blocks can be uh, calculated in an independent way uh, one of each other, okay? So this function that is called uh, E uh, per J per K, okay, 
is a natural candidate to be considered a task in our programming model. Okay, that's why where this multiply function that we don't know, I don't know what does, is defined here as a task. Okay, so we have this add task is in, in, in Python. Okay, and uh, we say to the the programming model here that this function multiply uh, as as three parameters. You know that in, in Python you can uh, avoid many things, no? Define many things. So because Python automatically infers the type of data, etc. So what in Java we'll do here is to define A, B, and C. But here we can skip A and B because of simple inputs, let's say. But we define C as an input output parameters. This means that here in the code we still pass uh, C, the matrix C. But we tell to the runtime, uh, be aware that this parameter has to be overwritten by the call to the function, okay? Uh, I mean, this is the more mm, complex uh, case in out, not the same parameter is input and output, but could be, so here what we have, we have a function with the three uh, inputs, A, B, C, and one output, which is the same uh, parameter C. Based on this information, which is very simple, because in the end of here, we're saying that this is a task, and with, when the runtime analyzes this task, says that, okay, I have these three parameters. Based on this information at runtime, so not at, uh, there is no analysis of the code, okay? It's everything, of course, at execution time. But based on this information, when the runtime finds the execution of this, uh, the call to this function, to the execution of this function, uh, this is not uh, this graph, eh? It's not the graph exactly of this, but just to understand. Uh, the runtime builds what we call a task dependency graph. Okay, So each of these uh, circles represent a call uh, to one function that we defined as task in, uh, in the sequential code. And different colors here uh, mean different uh, functions, simply. Okay. This is, we use this representation, this graphical representation, just for uh, understanding what happens, okay? Uh, at when the application finishes, you can see, okay, my application looks like this. I have this parallel uh, task. You can see that the parallelity, by the way, the most important thing, it's here. You can see that this green circle, for example, that are here, are run in parallel. Why? Because they have dependencies if you look at the dependencies, the arrows here are uh, data dependencies, is what is called here, okay? You can see that this green uh, function is independent from this one. The dependencies for something that happens before, but the execution of these, all this green, okay, is, can occur in parallel. In parallel means that as long as I have enough resources where to run that function, I can uh, execute in parallel. So what we did, uh, so what we do um, is nothing uh, magic. So the parallelization that we implement with our framework is through this uh, uh, understand of the calls to the functions. So mm, there is nothing, there is no code analysis, there is no change in the code, nothing, nothing magic, nothing strange, no artificial intelligence that changes the code. Simply we analyze, we analyze the calls to what is defined as task, okay? So that's why the powerful part is in the runtime that understand how the functions are uh, called, how are defined, etc. So in the end, uh, what uh, you are achieving with this is that uh, you have a, a, a larger data, okay, than the storage that you have. Why? Because uh, you are distributing the, the task. So is you are still in your application, you have your mm, single address space because everything for you runs in in the machine where you start the application, but then the runtime using different nodes or an available uh, computing platform is like uh, extending the memory and in general the, the CPU that you have uh, that you can, can, can use. Uh, so, uh, more, more uh, some other de detail uh, that, of course, um, you can include in this application any kind of, of code that you can have. 
So the fact that the, the course to these uh, the functions is sequential um, doesn't avoid that you can have MPI task inside the general what we call workflow. Many times, you know, our group is called workflows and distributed computing, but we don't offer a workflow um, programming as there are more explicit you know, workflows system as I don't know if you know Galaxy, which is also a graphic. Okay, it's workflow because this is a workflow. It's a duck, no. Uh, so, some more things that you can do with the programming model. So, okay, the task is a basic information that you have to, to provide to, uh, to the runtime, but then you can also say uh, many more things to the runtime. For example, through the constraint annotation. Constraint is a way of uh, driving the scheduling of the task to a specific resource. Uh, so imagine that, for example, you have uh, a function that needs, and you know this because you are the developer of the application, a function that needs four cores to be executed. Uh, so you can use the constraint, um, not here, but anyway, there is one which is the uh, one attribute of constraint is the computing unit. Okay, uh, so you say computing units equal four. So when the call to this function is uh, intercepted by the runtime, the runtime will look at the list of resources that you provide because there is a configuration file in the runtime. If you're using supercomputer is uh, already provided in the, in the system. But in general, the, what the runtime does is a matchmaking to what is available in terms of, uh, of infrastructure with what is requested by the, uh, the task in this case, okay? Or, for example, you can say I need this task needs uh, six, six giga of uh, of RAM because it's a memory intensive uh, task, not CPU intensive, and uh, and there is a larger list of uh, uh, attributes that you can tell the runtime to uh, to check. So constraints is the way to drive the scheduling, and then as I said, for example, you can add. Mm, Many more things. For example, you can say, ah, computing units was here, sorry. Um, for example, here you can say that uh, you need to treat this task not as a simple sequential uh, code, but as an MPI task. Uh, this is um, very useful. Uh, actually, it was a requirement from our user in the past year, because in this way, you can uh, have what we call um, heterogeneous workflows in the sense that you can uh, mix few sequential code okay, uh, with uh, MPI, MPI code. As you can see here, there is no definition of the, of the task. Why? Because the, the application is uh, um, it's executed through MPI run. Okay, so we, here we are saying that when you get to this point, you have to execute these names uh, binary using MPI run on 16 computing nodes, okay? okay? And each of these computing nodes, uh, in, in total, I need 248 uh, calls. So what happens here is that when comes, um, again, uh, finds the call to this function, uh, will use the proper number of nodes and uh, threads inside uh, those nodes that that are uh, reserved, okay? I will show you an example later. So in this way, you can avoid, for example, first of all, you can you can do, uh, you, one of the benefits is that you can run in the same application, uh, as I said, mixed code, sequential and uh, uh, parallel code, pure parallel code, without having to enqueue two jobs. This is something that is very powerful because, you know, when you deal with a um, queue system in a supercomputer, uh, you cannot run whatever you want and whenever you want, right? So you have the queue systems that checks your account. And for example, you cannot run maybe two jobs at the same time, or you have in a way limited time. Using our framework, you can run just one job. That okay, is bigger, needs more uh, resources. But in general, these kind of jobs in the queue, in the supercomputers are, have a precedence with the smaller uh, uh, application, smaller uh, requests that use less resources. This is in general the, the policies in the supercomputers are, are like this. 
So this is very powerful functionality because you can uh, mix, uh, you know, many times what the researchers do, they run many pipelines using MPI with different parameters. So many uh, QSubmit, not QSub in this run, for example, and this consumes a lot of their uh, accounting, right? So using, uh, defining this application, these pipelines inside a comms uh, application will uh, enhance, will speed up a lot the execution just in terms of accessing the, uh, releasing the, the queue system, okay? So some other advanced uh, capability that we offer is the task failure management. When you deal with the big uh, workflows, okay, let's talk about workflows, in terms of uh, calls to many pipelines, for example, what of course in the bioinformatics application, they, they run big pipelines many times with different data, with different parameters, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens when you run thousands of tasks? Probably some will fail, of course. So through this task failure uh, management, so with this attribute on failure, you can um, uh, deal with the failures at task level. In this way, you can, for example, say that if there is a failure in one of the of these big execution, the runtime can just skip that part of the of the pipelines. So in this way, you can save the entire uh, execution, just skipping some of the results, if it's what you want. Otherwise, you can say, okay, it's a disaster, cancel of the job. But still, canceling the job means that you are again saving uh, resources. Because when you use a uh, course in a supercomputer, uh, you are you're being accounted for that. So with this capability, you can stop the application saving uh, CPU hours. Or you can say that, for example, this case can't help access. So that means, you know, we have this task with dependencies, right? So if there is one of these tasks that fails and you have many other tasks in the same time that are running parallel, you're just saying, okay, discard the rest of the, uh, of the execution in a way. I, I don't care, continue. So in this way, uh, you can, uh, this why also we talk about, you now the title of my talk is dynamic workflows management, because you can dynamically drive the execution of, a, of an application, of a big application, depending on the behavior of the single task of the application, okay? Together with this, I don't think that is in this presentation, together with this, we have the exception management. So you can integrate Failure management with exception uh, exception management. You can raise specific exception inside a task that is executed in one of the nodes and uh, uh, transferring this exception to the main code, okay? So where the tasks are executed and say, okay, if there is an exception in one of these tasks and I can deal with the failure, but also I can decide what to do with the uh, next calls in, uh, in my big application. So in this way, you are dynamically changing the behavior of the uh, of the workflow execution depending on an exception. The exception doesn't mean uh, error, failure. Exception is something that you can raise, pass back the control to the main code, and decide, for example, to execute one part of the execution, one branch of your uh, application, or another, depending on the results, for example, or of a task. So it's a very powerful. Uh, uh, feature of the, our runtime. Um, so support of MPI task, just graphically to understand what uh, the, the, the comms runtime is able to do. Okay, I have reflection here, I don't see. So here you can see that comms does all these uh, nodes allocation for your MPI task in a completely transparent way, okay? So here you say that you want, again, to run this uh, function. Or where um, you, you need two computing units uh, for uh, for each one of the uh, of the calls uh, to, uh, to to the function, okay? And uh, each of these uh, spawns three uh, processes. This is processes when you mix MPI run with the uh, OpenMP. So here you're saying how many threads of an OpenMP this function is using internally. But you can see that here the, these allocation of the tasks of the nodes is automatically performed by, uh, by comms. So if you have thousands of tasks that are running, comms ensures that at least 
these uh, four uh, nodes are uh, dedicated to the execution of this MPI function when it is uh, called. So you don't have to deal with the allocation of the of the nodes for a specific MPI uh, part. And here, uh, of course, as I said before, you can uh, you can uh, uh, mix uh, MPI with uh, this kind of execution, multiple program with uh, multiple uh, data. Again, this is an uh, advanced feature that you can you can do when you have to to run MPI uh, applications. So the same task but with different uh, different uh, data. This uh, task definition uh, internally, what COMS uh, does for you is to allocate the proper number of, uh, of resources and execute uh, on the, for, uh, for example, in this case, what if it was a folder of data to remember, okay? And by the way, there is also a way to mix uh, uh, COMS uh, task with OMS uh, task. So we have cases when we have uh, uh, two, so two, two levels parallelly. So we have cases where applications that are composed of comps mm, invocation with OMS at the lower level uh, task. Uh, so this is a summary bit of the uh, the failure management. As, as I said, you have different options. You can retry the task fail. You can retry. You can cancel next task in the dependency graph. You can decide to fail because the application failed, but you still save your uh, uh, resources, or you can ignore. So the, all the the general application continues uh, running, okay. And uh, so you can ignore part of the execution uh, if a task fails in a stable uh, device. Again, if uh, a stable means, for example, that in this computing continuum, not maybe in a supercomputer, you can have some Raspberry that for some reason fail, okay. And you can still uh, continue all the uh, the application. So this uh, task failure, exception management, etc., enables the dynamic workflow uh, programming using our uh, our framework. Uh, so comps exception is what I, I told you. Inside the task, you can raise a comps exception that is transferred back to the main application. Okay? So you can control the behavior of the uh, of the general workflow. Uh, other things, you can group tasks, for example, to manage the, uh, again, the uh, behavior of uh, exception. So you can raise an exception at the uh, task group level. Again, what uh, you can do with, uh, with this uh, uh, programming framework, checkpointing. This is some, another thing that is, um, it's been requested by our users. Again, when you have longer running applications, this application for some reason will, will fail, not because of the resources, but probably because of, of the conditions in the, in the code. With checkpointing, what uh, you can do is uh, uh, save the status. You can do a, you know, a photo of the execution at uh, some point. This again saves you if the application has fails for some reason and you cannot uh, re, re execute, uh, you cannot continue, let's say, the execution. At least you can restart from the uh, last checkpointing, checkpointed state. So, in this way, again, it's a way to uh, not re execute all the application, reusing again the, the, the resources. So it's a way to save time and to save accounts in terms of CPU hour. Uh, you can do it in an automatic way, failing to, to the runtime, save the status each 10 minutes, for example, or you can do it um, saying checks every time that there is a finished task, save the status, or you can do it in the, in the code, there is a, there is a call, this a snapshot, okay? You can manually snapshot uh, your execution. What comes does, of course, there is a bit of a overhead in this case because you know saving the status of the task means saving all the uh, objects that are shared by by the task, and you are using storage a bit. But it's a way to uh, avoid reschedule again longer running uh, application and reducing the uh, the resources. 
Um, this is a bit a summary of what, of what we do. So you have the sequential code, Python, Java, C++, C++ whatever. Okay? Whatever is annotated as code is uh, managed by the, the comps runtime. Not all the code, of course, is that tasks. So you can, uh, there are things that are, there is no reason. Small running uh, functions that are called just one or two times don't like to be tasked. Okay. Um, so what is defined as task is managed by, by the, the runtime that internally has a several components. So there is a task analysis that generates this task wrap and the task analysis is done continuously in a dynamic way. So the, the complete picture will be generated just at the end. You can check what is done in the logs and also we have a graphical interface where you can see these ballets that are created. Okay. Uh, there is the monitor part that, to check that everything uh, flows properly. And then there is the important part is this resource management. Uh, this resource management uh, takes care of allocating the proper resources on the proper uh, cluster, for example. You can see here that we have these different backends, clouds, uh, clusters, supercomputers, Together with this, you can, as I explained, you can use containers, of course, set your task. So everything is treated by comps, and you can do this inside the same application. So you can use heterogeneous uh, backends inside the application. You can have application that uh, do some preprocessing in the, in the cloud, for example, because they'll need HPC resources. And then when this data is produced, comps move the data to the HPC resource, and that's... <clears throat> a longer uh, execution in an automatic way, okay? So what we achieve is, as I said before, that we uh, exploit the inner parallelism of the execution of the applications, and we completely transparently deal with the resource uh, technical details. So you, or oh, I don't know, <clears throat> your background, but you as a developer of application, just have to deal, concentrate on your science, on your code, not on the Mare Nostrum or Leonardo detail of you. So at level of the more of the runtime again, something that is quite useful, but depending on the actual application, is the concept of um, <clears throat> malleability that is also called elasticity is something that comes from, you know, it was, it's very common in clouds. Now in cloud, there is this big uh, feature, uh, relevant feature that is the elasticity, meaning that you can uh, um, uh, use and release virtual machines depending on the, on the actual load of, a, of an application. Uh, so in cloud, what we do, for example, the, comp, the runtime automatically can use uh, nodes of a cloud, so virtual machines in a cloud. And you know that when you use a public provider, for example, in this case, you pay real money. Um, so instead of allocating 10 virtual machines for two hours, because your application needs two hours for the complete running, what COMPS does uh, opens the new virtual machines depending on the actual load. The same, uh, we do more or less the same in clusters that have the SLARM um, elasticity feature. You know, the SLARM is for supercomputers, so very static machines in the end, you know, where there is a very uh, fine level accounting and scheduling of the resources, but there are some clusters that this option enable. Uh, this option, what it does basically is to um, allow the user to request for new, uh, for new resources with a new job in SLARM, you no? Know? Uh, but then uh, aggregate the, the jobs. You know, I don't know if you are aware of this uh, capability of Slurm. Uh, this means that at some point you will have, if you request for 10 nodes, at some point you say, okay, I want to run another job and aggregate the jobs. Uh, you have five more nodes. And then you, you will have uh, uh, the X allocation, X extended with Y uh, nodes. 
okay? With comms, you can have this again uh, automatic. If comms detects that there is a, a rise in the number of tasks that are executed and the actual reservation of nodes is not enough, ask for more nodes to the LAN, okay? Automatically. <clears throat> so in this way, you are uh, requesting for, for more uh, nodes uh, without doing it manually and inside the same workflow whenever needed. Of course, when you do um, uh, an SQ command, when you request for nodes, you don't have it immediately. So there is always a certain time, um, seconds or also minutes. So you have to think that you can use this feature if it makes sense. So if you have very long running applications, Okay, when it makes sense to wait for new nodes to be available. But still, this is, will be much quicker than do it you, uh, manually into different uh, applications. So this is a quite advanced feature, but uh, not always has to be, be used. So containers, uh, of course, now everything uh, runs in containers, also in supercomputers. That's why the, there is Singularity, which is actually a version of, the, of Docker, let's say, but for supercomputers. So um, anyway, we uh, now run a lot of applications directly in containers, meaning that you can uh, use a, spe a special annotation, this container, to say that you want to run a task inside uh, of a container. And you can specify if you want to run with the Docker, with Singularity. <clears throat> there is also you Docker, not you know now you Docker and which is the image that you want to use to uh, start the container from, okay? And then you can say the different things. You can say that, for example, I want to run this task inside the container, and I know that there is already the binary that I want to run inside the container. So here, pass means that there is no code inside the task definition because the task is defined inside already the, uh, the, the, the container when it's uh, started. So again, this automatically is transparent to you. Whenever you, whenever uh, comps find this call, a container is started. So comps talks with uh, Singularity or with Docker, whatever, and starts the, the, the container and runs whatever you want to run. Then there is another option when you want to, for example, in this case, there is the comps base image. You want to run some code that you specified here from an image for where, for example, you have, um, some base library that you want to run your simulation, okay? And um, yeah, then, then there are other options. You can find the documentation. For example, here is not uh, in this example, but of course you can also say uh, which data you want to use. So there is the idea of mounting volumes inside the container. So comps will do it for you, okay? Uh, other things that you can do, you can define the, a task as a stream. So you can mix uh, pure sequential uh, code with data streams, meaning that, uh, for example, uh, this, instead of having you know, uh, static uh, tasks that are executed when the data is available, okay, and then produce some data and then the process finishes, here you have the tasks that are running as long as there is some data stream input in, in or out. And we is made if you know Kafka, so this is the idea of Kafka, but inside a comp task. Um, maybe we can skip this. We have integration with the different persistent storage. Some that also we do in other group of uh, BSC, but the way you can plug uh, distributed storage systems. Uh, I mean this. I mean this slide just saying that you can. We have a special version of comps that we call with agents where uh, actually each, you can have a distributed set of comps runtimes running in uh, as microservices or in containers in a distributed way. And these uh, comps agents uh, run different parts of your application, okay? So this is very useful in this edge to cloud environment where you have really distributed set of nodes where the data is produced, okay? Imagine a city where each uh, agent creates different data, okay? that is generated in different parts. Okay, this is, let's keep this. Um, something that is 
uh, important for you uh, is the concept of trace. I don't know if you know what trace is. So a trace uh, is um, information that is generated uh, by a program in general. Uh, in this case, we use uh, uh, tools again from, from VSC. I don't know if you know Extra and Paraver. Anyway, traces are information of what happens inside processes of your application. And this, uh, and this information is uh, very useful because um, the representation of the, these traces uh, allows you to understand <coughs> how the application is behaving. <coughs> Just putting tasks inside your application and having these nice circles that runs in parallel uh, doesn't mean that your application is, uh, <coughs> is developed in an optimal way and behaves above all in a cluster in an optimal way where what we look for is the perfect balance, for example, between uh, computation and, uh, and data. Okay. So once you have your comps, for example, application developed, you want to check, first of all, that everything runs properly, but then that everything, if you're using above all a cluster, it's most used in a, in a cluster, that the resources that cost some accounting for you, maybe you don't pay somehow, but still you have a limited number of CPU hours, that everything is perfectly filled, okay? That there are not black holes. Black holes here means, you know, these, these colors, are called to that comps, okay? So here you have these uh, four blocks, more or less, you can see that are four nodes in Marin Austin, okay? And here, uh, blue means there is some preprocessing, uh, then there is solving triangular matrices, I don't know what it is, and then there are the long run, okay? So here, more or less, you can see that it's quite well balanced application because there are few black holes. Of course, there can be black holes because there is some point when there is no uh, computation inside this node. Uh, but here means that you are for somehow paying for that uh, CPU and you are not using it. So it's not good. Also in Leonardo or Marinostrum, et cetera, uh, if, you, mm, if you don't use properly the resources, you can receive some mail from the administrator saying, hey, it happened to me, for example, that I was not properly using the, the node. Um, because the application was doing something strange with the uh, threads, and that was overusing the resource. So I got the warning from the system administrator saying, hey, you cannot do this. So you have to take care that your application do perform the resource utilization in an optimal way, in a well-balanced way. Okay, so this is, these tools, the traces tool, are a very powerful way of managing, of controlling uh, the behavior of your application in an HPC uh, cluster. Uh, other things that you can say if you can do, as I said, there is a very simple graphical application that you can use to monitor the execution of the of the application. Okay, but just the graphic. Uh, we support now data provenance. Provenance is uh, I don't know if you know what it is, but it's a way uh, to um, reuse uh, a comps application. In general, the, the provenance means that you uh, store the execution of an application. So you save both the code and the data that is used. And it's very useful for uh, sharing the, the, the run of an application. You know, now that when you write a paper, for example, you are asked for the artifact. So you have to say to a reviewer, okay, this is my application, this is the code, and this is the data that I use. If I'm the reviewer, I have to download the code, I have to use your data, and try to replicate your your code to check that what you wrote in the paper is is uh, correct. With provenance, my work it could be much easier because I can download from a repository your comps data with provenance enabled, and I just need the comps in my machine, and I download the description. I don't go into details now. Uh, I download the description of your code and the data that you told me, and I can just run, and that's it. And I have the your same workflow. Hopefully, just the same execution as you did, so I can certify that you did the, the proper uh, execution as you explained in the, in the paper. The paper is just an example, but in general, it's to reuse the code and the data uh, with your colleagues. So, uh, a bit late, so I want to 
to say something that we also we are also doing as a parallel uh, research in our in our group uh, is uh, this leap, this, this uh, distributed and parallel machine learning uh, library. So this is um, is built on top of uh, PyComs. You know, you you can see that we use uh, Coms and PyComs are the same things. The only thing that the PyComs is the Python version of Coms. Some point we should use just one name. But anyway, uh, this is a, a set of uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that are internally parallelized by through comps. So the nice thing is that you don't have to uh, know comps completely. Um, it's based on, uh, I don't know if you know, scikit-learn uh, library. So it's a bit, uh, um, rep we replicate a bit the concept of scikit-learn with the uh, fit the predictor uh, paradigm, okay? But internally, we parallelize the, uh, the execution of the algorithms uh, through the concept of a distributed array. A distributed array is a way of taking your data set that you want to uh, use for your machine learning uh, application, and internally, comes parallelize the execution of the function that use blocks of your data set. So you load the data set in a DDLib application and the comps internally, you say more or less how many blocks you, you want to use and this is mapping done depending on the on the data set type and on the node that you have available. Uh, so you load the, the data and comps automatically distribute this data in a, in a cluster, for example, okay? And as you can imagine, uh, there are tasks that we wrote uh, that works in parallel on those pieces of, uh, of data. So in this way, we uh, parallelize the sequential execution of scikit-learn-like uh, uh, algorithms. So far, we are working, uh, above all, as I said, in classic machine learning algorithms, from clustering, classifications, uh, we have matrix decomposition, uh, uh, functions together with these and uh, uh, linear regression. You can do uh, k fold and grid research optimization on, on your code, uh, etc. But now we are also starting to work a bit on uh, also neural networks. Okay, so we're starting to implement also neural networks in this uh, library. And uh, what we do also is um, uh, again in a sort of two level. Uh, kind of parallelism, you can integrate uh, PyTorch code in, in, in a, in a comps uh, bigger workflow. What we do is to, PyTorch, you know, that um, is internally already parallelized, okay? but what we can do, we can distribute uh, in PyTorch application across nodes. And this is just uh, something maybe you can have a look and we can help you if you, if you need it. But anyway, this is a very powerful application uh, library that we are using a lot, and also our users are using a lot, because no need to understand what comps is. So you can forget all, all this hour. <laughs> if you want to use just this lib, it's already parallelized by us. Okay? So you just need the, the data set, and then you decide the estimator. So the estimator, in the end, is, uh, is uh, what you want to use to learn from your data, so depending on the algorithm that you want to implement, not classificator, uh, cluster, etc. So you load the, the data, you feed. Feed means that you are training, no? the uh, train the algorithm based on uh, on your data set, label or not label, and then on the uh, train data uh, train uh, model, you perform a prediction on some uh, data that you. Uh, that it wanted to use for the for, for the prediction. So very simple code, more or less. No, you load your data, for example, from CSV file. You say the block size and the number of uh, of blocks. And in this case, you want to do a, a k-means clustering with uh, ten clusters in uh, in k-means. You do a fit on the uh, data set on the training data set, and then you have some testing data. For, for the prediction. That's it. It's internally means that there is comps on the backend that optimizes the distribution of the data and does the, the parallelization. I think that we can skip this uh, speed late, sorry. <laughs> but just to tell you that internally, of course, there is some task that we implemented, okay, that works with this idea 
So the magic again here is this idea of the distributed array, the S array, that is parallelized to comp's function that we that we wrote. Okay. So the sample code of a cascade support vector machines parallelized with uh, with comps. Um, again, the code. I mean, this is the internal. This is the user code. Very very simple, no? Very very clean. Fit predict. And internally, this is what happens. It's a comps application that generates some uh, parallel uh, tasks. In this case, I think, is was very simple uh, data set. That's why there are very few. And again, if we look at the, at the traces, you can see that more or less is there is a balanced uh, usage of the resources in uh, Marinot. So we have papers where we compare with the other more famous uh libraries okay if you want to, to have a look uh then we have something which is uh called the task nesting task nesting is a way uh is an optimization of the runtime uh when uh we have um you can uh, program your application using uh, several runtime instances okay so nesting means that at some point comps will delegate the the load of task uh, execution to other uh, runtime instances. So it's a way of balancing the, the execution. Uh, then, I mean, these are most mm, more advanced uh, tools that we develop uh, to help uh, uh, researchers in general, developers to uh, easily access the HPC resources. This was a eFlows for HPC project that ended uh, last month. Uh, where we did try to offer higher level uh, services for the executing, deploying and executing the application for no HPC uh, users, so dealing with intricacies of queues, etc., uh, etc. Et so just to explain, case uh, this one. And of course, we, are, we have worked a lot now that in. Uh, um, Edge uh, projects, edge uh, HPC uh, projects, for example, is one that was responsible of uh, where we deployed the the, the comps runtime in this kind of infrastructure where we you produce the data in some places and you compute the data in some other place, and we developed this healthcare application where the data is produced by a smartwatch uh, for electrocardiograms, for example, and then there is the model which is trained in. Uh, in the Mare Nostrum, offered as a service in, for prediction in, in the cloud. And then there is a doctor that checks the, uh, the results of the application. And uh, that's it. Uh, so you can have more information about comms in our web page. We have tutorials, we have documentation, uh, we have a lot of things. We have uh, containers, uh, virtual images, whatever you need. And also we do every, January, February, uh, tutorial physical at uh, BSE, if you want to, to join uh, on the usage of comms and uh, and sleep. I think that I'm on time or less. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Daniele.